Hello and welcome to the intro video for this class. We're going to look at opening uh, Photoshop for the very first time. Now you won't see this screen when you first open with the images. Uh, you'll see this uh, down here at the bottom and you'll see this. Uh, right now you'll, you're seeing uh, some images that I recently had open in Photoshop. So eventually you're going to get to the point where you've got some stuff here that you don't want to see anymore and and may not be accurate anymore you may not have it on your computer any longer or cer certainly not in the location it might have first been so what you would do is go up to uh, file open recent and you can go down here to cle clear recent file list and this is the way it would look when you first get Photoshop. Now there's several things here uh, and it tells you your recent work would appear here as you just saw. Uh, but there are uh, other modules in this that you can look at. And if you go right over here and click on show all you can see uh, these modules and more. So you can click on uh, things like this as long as you're connected to the internet and you'll see uh, examples and videos and, and so forth. So I'm going to close that down. Uh, you can see you can get things for design, uh, layers, and so forth. So let's just go back here. If we want to start new, we, we can click on this, or we can click here. We can open a file that currently exists. So it just opens up your regular file folder to look for things. Uh, if you click on New, it'll allow you to create a new document for adding things in. So you could bring in maybe multiple pictures into an image if you want to create a collage, or if you want to make a new ad or something like that. You can see uh, right now that there are 300 PPI images, that's pixels per inch, and there are 72 pixels per inch. Uh, these aren't images, they're just blank files. So if I click on this, this is a typical 8 by 10, and if you go over here you can see you can change the orientation to be horizontal or portrait mode. Uh, here's the resolution again, just like we clicked on over there. You can say I want black or white or some other color. If you want to click on that, you can click here on this and it brings up the color picker and you can say I want it to be on red. And you click on create. So in Photoshop you would get this document and uh, it's 8 by 10. So if we want to check that out, uh, there it is on the rulers. It's 8 inches and 10 going down. We'll get to the rulers later on. Uh, but this kind of gives you an idea of what to expect when you first open up Photoshop. If you want to open up again, an image will click on open from here. And you can see uh, the different folders that I have and so forth. And uh, if I double click, that's a PSD file. So this is my grandson uh, playing with a ball, which I turned around and did some things with. It's not a great image, it's just one I cut out uh, so I could add things to it. For instance, if I wanted to click on the layer below it, which is the background layer, uh, I can go over here. This is also a color picker. I can click on that. And again, I can say I want red or any other color for that matter. We can click again. Uh, we can go to yellow and we can fill that edit fill with the foreground color so we have the yellow fill so there's lots of things that we can do very easily in Photoshop we can uh, but I just wanted you to see the uh, the way it looked and once we don't have an image open anymore it's going to default back to this screen but now notice we have this image in our little catalog and we can click on this view which gives it just the name of the file, when it was created, and how big the file is. And in this view, obviously, it's the photo plus the name of the file. 
So this gives you a little bit of an overview over just bringing Photoshop up and either making a new image or opening a, an existing image. Okay, we're inside of Photoshop now and I wanted you to see uh, what we could do with an image right off the bat. And uh, this is a very, very old photograph of my wife and I. I don't even want to venture a guess as to what year. I just know it was Christmas time. So over here is our toolbox. And uh, if we want to, we can click on this little arrow at the top and make it a two-column uh, toolbox so we don't have to have it running all the way down the page. I like to have all the real estate inside of Photoshop that I can get. So I keep the uh, single column of the tools if I can. But if I'm crowded, I just simply click that to get the two columns. Now you've got a handout that tells you about these tools, but we're going to also go through all of those. And I also want to uh, just mention some navigation type things and, and so forth right off the bat. Uh, this is, if we go to Window, Workspace, this is the Photography Workspace. And over here on the right hand side, this information, these panels, represent the Photography uh, workspace. If I click on painting, you notice the workspace very quickly changes. We have paint brushes and the, the rubber stamp and so forth. So looks a bit different uh, with that workspace. Again, uh, graphics and web is going to change a little bit. They all have a little bit different look. And this is for making video. And you see the timeline down here for video. Working with 3D. And we have the 3D information here. And the essentials. So the essentials really takes up quite a bit of real estate. But it can be helpful too. Just be aware that that is there. Now just because it says that we can take and change uh, this however we want to. So normally this would default without history uh, and it would have paths in it. And layers wouldn't probably be there either. I don't remember for sure. But let's just say uh, we want to go to the workspace for painting. So now when we go back to photography it has the changes that we just made. So we can edit uh, these panels however we want to. We can close whatever we want. We can add whatever we want. I myself like to have layers and history open. And we'll talk about what those things are along the way too. But here's layers. I can just click and drag. And once that blue box appears, It'll let us just let go of it and becomes part of that panel. Uh, so now I'm going to go to history. Now let me tell you the importance of history. Uh, it used to be in the future, in the beginning iterations of Photoshop, there wasn't such a thing as the history uh, palette. And what that basically means is there was no history. Whatever you last did. Um, was the, the only thing that you could undo. Now you have tons of undos. So if you make a mistake, you can go back and back and back and back. Originally, like I said, you only had one click uh, of the mouse and it was too late if you did anything else. So it, right now, if I make a copy of this, I'm gonna move this out of the way for a minute. Let's just put it here in the box. If I make a copy of this, and it's very easy to do, I can just hold down my control key on a PC or command key on a Mac and press the letter J. That makes a, a brand new 
copy of that layer. If we go into history, if, we're, if we click the original and go back, you see there's only one. But if we click on the history and go forward, we have two layers. So the history is very valuable. Let's just say I click on a paintbrush and yellow is the uh, current color, then the color picker. And I just go like this. And now if I show you the bottom layer, this is only existing on this copy, layer one, and not background. So if I look in history, that's changed now too. I have a brush tool. If I go back before this happened, which is right here, that's the second brush and the first brush. So now it's a clean copy, but if I go back and go forward, so it's like going backwards and forwards in time. The history brush is worth its weight in gold. And I'll show you how to set the history up in just a few minutes because we're going to work on the Photoshop preferences. But I wanted you to see uh, the importance of having uh, these particular things. Now, I don't like the order that they're in right now. I like to have layers on the other side of channels. So I click and hold that down and just bring that over and let go. So now I have my channels, which you see is red, green, blue. Every image is made up of red, greens, and blues. All three of them together, and you have this. So let's just run over here real quick. And let's just turn, please excuse my hoarseness today. I have several days every week uh, that I turn up kind of hoarse. So let's just, uh, and notice too, whatever uh, layer is gray is the active layer. So if I try to do anything right now, this eyeball is turned off. It's on here, but it's off here. So if I try to paint right now, whoa, that's plenty loud. You see the do not enter uh, sign that's on the image. That's because this layer is turned off. Now, it not only shows, but it allows us to uh, work on it, do things with it. So if I click on this one, this is now the active layer. I can turn that off. And now I can paint on it. So now we have uh, layers with painting on all of it. See? Well, notice you can't see that line. Okay, let's just change the color of this. And let's go with blue. And I'm going to paint. And I can't see anything. But if I turn this eyeball off, there's the blue. That's because, and we'll get into this more, don't be confused or overwhelmed, whatever's on top is over uh, the image. It's just like laying a, a paper, a, a photograph on top of another photograph. You can't see the photograph underneath until you take the top photograph off and then you see the bottom photograph. So we'll get into all of that a little later. I'm going to throw that one away and actually let's just do the history thing. Let's march backwards until we get rid of the garbage that we created and let's go one more and that way we only have the one layer. Alright, let's set Photoshop up. Alright, in Photoshop we can go to Edit and down to Menus. Now, menus allows us to uh, go in here and create shortcuts to anything in our menus. Here are, are the menu items up here. They correspond to what you see right here. Now, on a couple of things, or, or at least this one thing, you're going to have to kind of trust me. Uh, and we'll get to the functionality of this later. But just to show you uh, a, a shortcut change or a shortcut addition, we're going to do something that's really, I think, very important. Uh, if we make 
a selection of something and I'm just going to make a goofy little selection around my head and do a control J. Now that makes a copy, remember that puts that on its own layer. And don't have to worry about being able to do this stuff right now. I just want you to see what it will do. So now if I uh, want to make a, a particular selection around my wife's head, I can make this same kind of a selection or I can click on the elliptical marquee to make a selection, which that's how that works. Uh, if you hold down the shift key, it makes a perfect circle. But let me. Okay, so you see that's a perfect circle. I click somewhere else and it goes away. Uh, if I click like this, you see it's kind of oblong. But if I now push down the shift key, it's a perfect circle again. So just something for your information. I'm going to make a little selection right here. Let's say I want to fine tune that a little bit. And this is kind of a, a strange use of the tool. But under select, there's actually a transform selection. It allows us to move the selection. So if I let go, you see that it actually will move that selection however I want. It gets even more powerful if I hold down the control or on a Macintosh the command key I can really start messing uh, with the angles of the curves and, and so forth. So we can make really neat selections with this tool transform selection. So let's go down again into uh, the keyboard shortcuts and we're going to go to select that's where that was found and go down here to where that tool is and that's transform selection and you will just double click there and you don't have to use the same keyboard uh, controls that I'm using but they're safe ones because there's a uh, not that important thing saved here as a control F12. So if you just hold down your control key, command key on a Mac, and press the number key or the F12 key at the top while you keep the command or control button down, it will put that in for you. Then you go up here and click accept and OK. So now if I want to transform that already made selection or one over here I can hold down my control key F12 and the, the ability to transform that selection pops up okay hopefully you found that a little bit helpful let's go back down and I deselected this by doing a control D or you can go to select and say deselect and that will go away. All right, let's go down and, and work on something very important. Uh, you can't see it right now. It's below uh, Photoshop. So let me move the recording area down. And preferences. So we're just going to go to general. And I'll help you set yours up. So you might want to go through this while you're at home with your computer and look and see the settings that I have. Just push pause on your video and then you can look at all the settings that are here. Uh, go to the second one, interface. Look at my settings here as well. I don't believe I've changed anything from the default. Same thing here. Uh, everything is checked up here except the top one. And don't check enable narrow options bar tools you can just pause again looking at what I have history log this can be a very important thing if you want to be able to track the steps you took in Photoshop 
It do, does use up a little room for your files, but it's not drastic. I myself don't track that. If I were working on some special uh, actions or something like that, which we'll get into later, uh, I might want to track the history. File handling. You can look at my preferences here. Um, especially the camera raw preferences, you can click right on that and bring up uh, camera raw. And if you look down here, uh, you'll see these are automatically open JPEGs with settings, automatically open TIFFs, uh, because we want both of those to be able to be opened. I'll move this recording area back up. <clears throat> we want these specific things checked otherwise I'll leave them alone uh, we're going to just go rapidly through export you can see I don't think I changed that at all uh, performance is uh, something that you really need to pay attention to if your graphics processor your video card that's in your computer will support it you need to click on use graphics processor Click on Advanced Settings and make sure OpenGL is checked. This will really speed up filters and, and uh, your graphics as you work on them. I uh, assigned roughly 69% of my resources here to Photoshop. Uh, I have 18 gigs or 18 megs of uh, active RAM, and this is how much I assigned to it. Uh, I wouldn't go over 75%. It'll tell you if you are. You can interfere with your operating system if you go too high. Uh, if you have multiple drives on your computer, this is a great place to go because uh, if you've got a drive that's very, very uh, empty, let's say, uh, you'll want to assign it as a, your scratch drive, which means Photoshop as it works will be going to that specific drive and doing a lot of work, writing back and forth constantly. So it's important to, that you have as much disk space available to Photoshop as possible because it does do some heavy work while you're in Photoshop. Uh, it will probably default to being on C, but if that's the only drive you have, then so be it. But you can see I've got a lot of storage left on my i i used to have um, stuff on my g drive it could be my backup backup but i've got plenty of room on my i drive all right cursors this is another biggie you see how mine are marked uh, if you mark yours this way and precise uh, you will see this specific uh, look when you use a painting brush uh, and when you are trying to do specific things you'll get this target and it is very helpful as well. Uh, the rest of this through here is not uh, important right now. You can just click OK. To make those changes take effect, you need to shut Photoshop down and reopen it. Otherwise, they may not take effect until the next time you open up Photoshop. Uh, there is one other place I want to show you. Uh, under uh, file handling, if you click on it, uh, I set mine uh, right off the bat. I turn this automatically save recovery on. You probably saw it if you paused and set yours up the same way. But this is very important. Uh, set that to five minutes uh, because you can be working along and all of a sudden your system crashes and you lose what you're working on. So the first thing you want to do when you open Photoshop up is to uh, save your image. Uh, if you've got a photograph that, you're, that you want to work on Photoshop, you give it a new name and, and save it. And then every five minutes, this is going to automatically save for you. But when you're working, I'm going to go ahead and close that for now. When you're working on the image like this, here's what we'd do. We brought this up. We want to uh, work on the color cast that's in here, for example, because it is reddish. Uh, so we're going to uh, save this so we can work on it and not alter the original. So we do not a save because that will overwrite 
the current one. So we save as, we give it a new name. So in this case, let's move this up where you can see it. Uh, I'm going to call this Patent Steve Working. And PSD is important because that's a Photoshop document file, PSD. Uh, this will save the layers in case you have to make multiple layers. Uh, it saves all of your changes and you can open it back up and everything will look just like it did when you closed it. So let's do that. Now, if, I'm, uh, if I open this back up, it's going to still have this file or this layer here of just my head on it as well. It'll have both these layers. If you just save something uh, with the one layer when it opens back up, that's all you'll have. So if we uh, are working along and uh, we paint something in the image and let's just uh, create another layer and we'll paint again with another color And now let's say that these changes were really important, really artistic, whatever. If we do a control S or if we go up here and do a file save, it will automatically save to that file we just created a few minutes ago. So let's say we have lots and lots of layers like this. There's about 10 layers there. Well, if there were very important changes, if I took the red out of the eyes, color adjusted it, uh, made it so my wife's hair stood out just a little bit more, uh, and all of a sudden I lost power on the computer or Photoshop just crashed, what have you. Everything I did, the hour that I spent getting all of the colors and and the looks just the way I wanted because I am going to take this picture and turn it into a portrait. Uh, all of that would be lost. But now if I just do a control S, it's saved every time I do that. It's all updated. Now if I shut this down and I go back and open it up, Pat and Steve working, this is the file. Remember it's put it in here in our recent files open it back up, there's all the layers. So we've saved everything, even though we might have crashed. Also, if you're working along and you forget to do a file save, Photoshop, because we did that sitting in the preferences, Photoshop uh, save that for us automatically every five minutes. But it's better if you remember to do a control S. All right. Let's get on to some really important stuff. I'm going to just click and drag through there to turn this painting stuff off. And uh, I can get rid of those very easily too. I've got this one highlighted, right? So if I go down here and, and hold down my shift key and click, uh, it selects all of them and I can hit the trash can and they all go away. All right, let's go back to edit again. Let me move down with my recording area so you can see. I'm going to edit at the top and I'm going to go to toolbar. That's the tools that are over here on the side. We've got all of these tools at our disposal inside of Photoshop. When yours uh, it opens up for the first time, your tools are going to be very minimal over here on the left hand side. So what you do is uh, you move things back and forth inside these two panels. This is the toolbar. These are the extras. If I don't want to have that elliptical, remember that circle we created a while ago? If I don't want to have that in my toolbar, I can drag that back over here and it's no longer in my tools. So if I go back to my look here, notice that circle has now gone away. And if I click and hold, it's no, it's no longer there. It's over here. 
Now watch what happens over here when I bring that back. I'm going to click and drag. Now we've got it back again. And if I, if I clicked done and I hold this down, I just click and hold it down, there's the two of them together. Oops, you can't see that, can you? Yeah, you can. I moved it back. Uh, so, all of these tools, again, I'll go back to edit and down to toolbar. All you need to do is drag all of these things from the right side to the left that you want. All right, now I'm going to drag through this so you can copy to your Photoshop the exact way I have my tools here. Once you get familiar with Photoshop, you may want to say, I don't want that tool anymore, or maybe I want it in another place. And that's totally up to you. This affects the you know where things are on the toolbar and what goes with it. So whenever these have multiple items in it, means if I hold down on the tool with my mouse, the other tools will show as well. So here's that page, another page, another page, another page, and the last page. So hopefully you paused where you needed to in the video. You can go back if you want to. Uh, all of those are very important. Notice there are six different tools under this special tool right here. If I click done, here's that tool. And if I click and hold my mouse button, left mouse button down, there are the six tools. So a lot of these tools have multiple tools under them. And if you just uh, follow uh, what I had set up, you'll see those. Let me move the recording area back up again. And there we go. There's one last detail I wanted to show you in the preference palette. <clears throat> you should have caught it when, when you paused and looked at my settings, but I need to call special attention to it. I think Photoshop uh, defaults to 30 uh, history states, maybe 40. I've got mine up to 91. Now, you got to remember, every history state inside of Photoshop uh, requires a snapshot of basically all that's going on at that particular point. So it's like a recording of everything on that particular state. So the more states you have, obviously, the more RAM is being used on your computer. Uh, if you start having problems with your computer, if you run it as high as I did here, uh, you might want to back down to 40. But I find that sometimes when I'm using the clone stamp especially, uh, which involves a lot of sampling, so you're clicking, clicking, clicking a lot, uh, every one of those clicks is a history state. Uh, so I like to have a lot of uh, states available to me. And uh, I, some people go much higher than that. But again, it could slow down your computer or cause other little problems. But if I were you, I would try going more than the uh, fail-safe that comes in Photoshop. All right. Okay, now we're going to tackle the tools individually. Now, the very first tool in the tool palette over here is the move tool. If you want to turn the move tool on, you can simply hit the letter V as in victory. That is on your keyboard. Just press the letter V. So if I were down here on the paintbrush and made the paintbrush active and I wanted to go back to the move tool, I just go down to my keyboard on my computer, press V as in victory, and it's back on the move tool. Now what's the purpose of the move tool? Well, let's say we have a couple of layers here. 
So let me go back again and, and make a selection of just my head. Control J. Or we can go to edit, copy. That copies whatever we tell it to copy by selecting it. And then we do an edit, paste. So now we have that. Or you can do my favorite, which is Control J, which copies and pastes at the same time, doing the same job. So it's handy if you learn the keyboard shortcuts. Control J will make an exact duplicate of whatever selected. Or, in this case, if we have this layer selected, Control J makes an exact copy of the whole thing. All right, we'll throw that away. So now we have <coughs> my head on its own layer. So if my move tool is on, I can click and drag that head wherever I want. It can be kind of problematic if you've got two heads, but I hopefully uh, I hope that you can see the value of being able to grab something and move it around. Now, here's the thing that's really cool in Photoshop. Let's say you have lots of these layers, different things on different ones. I'm just going to go ahead and copy the head a few times, and I'm going to move them. Let's put one up here, and let's put one over here. So Steve's all over the place. Uh, what if I want to, to work on and move this copy up here instead of this one? Well... All you have to do is hold down your control or your command key if you're using a Mac and click on that layer and it jumps to that layer and now I can move it. If I want to move this one down here, control and click with the mouse and now I can move that one. Control click, control click, control click. Now the reason it's going in behind these two images is it's under the top one here and between the bottom one. So it's just like a deck of cards. If the Ace of Hearts was underneath the Ace of Clubs, this is exactly what would be taking place. It would completely cover it, okay? So the Move tool can be very, very handy. Now let me show you something else. Uh, another way to move about in an image. Up here, if you're in the workspace for photography, wherever you see this navigator, this is also a way to move around the image. If we want to make this image huge, we can do that. Small. Well, now I can't see the faces, but if I click over here where this red box is, I can move it up, look how gorgeous that lady is, and just move it down to the arm. If I want to make her face even bigger, so I can really zoom in. So I could fix this place right here on her face very, very quickly and easy and, and move back out again. Now, while we're here and we see these particular things, uh, yours may default to showing this histogram and a histogram is a representation of the color in your image. And in this particular case, we're seeing black and white. The left side of the image is where all your darks are. The right side of this is where the lights are. So you can see the image is fairly dark throughout. That's why you have so much information on the left and not so much on the right. So if we... Uh, did what they call a levels, and I'm you don't have to remember this, I'm just demonstrating something. I'm going to bring levels up, and uh, hopefully it'll come up. It doesn't want to, so we'll go to window and down to you know why it wouldn't come up because I greenhorned myself. If you're over here where the layers are turned off, you can't bring up levels or much of anything else. 
Look at all my filters. They're all grayed out. That means they won't work. Because I have to be on an active layer where the eyeball is turned on. So, remember that. So, here is uh, Levels. Let me drag it over here in the viewing area. And you see the same thing here as you see up here. Exactly the same thing. Uh, if I bring this lighter on the right side, remember this is the lights. These are the lights. These are the darks. This lightens the whole image up considerably. If I bring this in, it brings more darkness into the image. If I go to red, for example, and we have too much magenta, so if I slide this lighter to the right, look at the reds just start to go away real quickly. So do you see any advantage I have in Photoshop yet? Okay. So uh, let's just say we like the quick fix of getting rid of that. Uh, let me undo that real quick, and I'm going to show you something. Uh, we can go to history and go back before we made that change. See how drastic that is? Now you can really see the red eye in my wife. So if I go back here, and I'm in layers, and I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these other ones real quick. Um, we, we took care of the magenta, but... It, this isn't the ideal way to, to work on an image. It's one way. But let me show you something else. Control-L. If I bring this up, if we click on Options, the best way to tell, or to tell Photoshop to use this tool in the automatic mode is to click here. It, it won't be on this when you first open Photoshop, but if you click on Enhance Brightness and Contrast, or fine dark and light colors is actually my best choice, my favorite choice. Um, see what happened in the image already? Click OK. So if we go to history, go back. Now let's bring levels up again. Click auto. And it got rid of a lot of stuff, uh, just not enough stuff. So let's let's uh, let's undo that. If we want to ch undo things inside of Photoshop, uh, if you're on a PC, you hold down the Alt key and you get a reset. That would be the Option key on a Mac. So we can go back to the way it was, go into Options again, make sure it's on that fine dark and light. Click OK. Then click OK. Now we're going to go back and try it again. So Command or Control L and Auto. It's still not keeping nope it's going back to enhance brightness and contrast I uh, don't know why it's doing that when my recording of the screen is going on sometimes it interferes with other things inside of Photoshop so we can quickly fix that by just going here and it it definitely shows a great improvement uh, also under this particular tool there's a red eye tool if you set yours up like mine uh, it's in there so we can zoom in to the affected area and see it's it's too small and it's it's going kind of wonky so what we can do is select the eyes and I'm just going to try this like this our other eye actually isn't even messed up so we can limit the area this is going to affect and let's see if we can fix that it's just so there it goes uh, it also affected outside the eye so we would need to make an even better selection but we're not going to worry about that right now we'll get into red eye and and those sort of things later on uh, but rest assured we can definitely take care of red eye okay so we go to the next tool I've used it several times already this is the uh, marquee tool and uh, if you let your mouse hover over these tools a shortcut will pop up and you see rectangular marquee tool and we can basically I'm going to do a control zero and that fills the screen uh, it makes a uh, about any kind of uh, rectangular shape it's not a perfect rectangle until you hold down the shift key 
and then it won't do anything but make a perfect square. And then if we hold down the tool, we get the elliptical uh, marquee, which makes the circles. And if we hold down the shift key, it makes the perfect circles. Okay, so that's one of the key selection tools inside of Photoshop. We use it a lot. Uh, sometimes uh, I will crop an image using the uh, marquee tool. Like if I want basically this much information in the image instead, I can go to image and crop. So that gives us a, a little bit easier way of cropping. The other way is much more difficult. Let's go to history and we'll go back here. All right, so that's uh, what's going on with the two uh, marquee tools. So next is the lasso tool. Now this tool is pretty amazing. It is also what's called a, a selection tool. And it's kind of like it says, it's a lasso. You can lasso whatever you want with it. Uh, it's a freehand type of tool. And it makes uh, whatever selection you want. Obviously, it's kind of loosey-goosey. Uh, it's a little harder to control than using something like this. But then I can't select my nose with that particular tool. Not even my wife's perfect nose. So with the lasso, what you need to do, let's just say I'm going to grab an eyeball here. And we just click and drag the lasso, and we've lassoed the eye. If we want to make it better, we can hold down the Alt key to take away. Now you see I'm just getting the actual eyeball in the picture is what I'm going for. And that's not the best way. I should have just started like this and been done with it. So not a perfect uh, selection. But if I want to add this eyeball, I can't just dr start dragging because then I lost that one. So let me do a control Z and bring that one back. And that's what I was going to say a while ago. If you, uh, while you're on the keyboard, if you want to go back a step, let me show you real quick. I'm going to add to the selection. And I'm holding down my shift key and making another selection. So it allowed me to add to the first selection. If I want to undo that, I can do a control Z. If I want to go back two spaces or more, I hold down control alt Z or command option Z on a Mac. And I can go back many, many steps as you see here. Okay. You can go back as many steps as you have history by a control alt z or a command option z okay now under there we also have what many call the polygonal lasso tool or the polygonal it's up to you polygonal lasso tool doesn't work well on a face because this is what it makes straight lines and when it reconnects it reconnects like that okay but it's great for things like buildings stop signs uh, anything that has uh, square edges on it, it works very nicely. Then <laughs> let me hit escape to get away from that. Control D to turn that off. And underneath that is the magnetic lasso. Uh, this is a horse of a different color, speaking of lassos. It looks for contrast. See how it's wrapping around the dark? And then we'll just hit escape. Try it again. You got to keep your mouse down as you drag it. You can't go fast. And it wants to reconnect. And there it's connected. So there's kind of a rough uh, thing. But it, it wants something that's high contrast. But selection tools, three of them here. Now here is uh, the most awesome of all the selection tools. This is the uh, quick selection tool. 
as you see here, and you can just press W to bring it up. But it looks uh, for similarities, and if we click, it's just painting a selection. See how it's working? Let's say we want the teeth. Eh, it's close, but it's no cigar. Now you can refine what it selects by holding down the Alt key, takes away, and if we want to add, we just click it some more. And it learns as you go. So high contrast, again, is a real friend of these more automatic tools inside of Photoshop. Underneath that is the Magic Wand tool. Uh, a lot of people refer to this as the Tragic Wand tool because it can really uh, go crazy. So let's just click and you see uh, you can set the tolerances on this uh, and you can also change the sample area. You can also adjust these. Uh, it is a tool that I never ever use. But it's there. Uh, maybe for a background or something like that, like a sky uh, that you want to knock out, this might be a good tool. All right. This is the crop tool. So with the crop tool, you can go into an image and set uh, any one of these. I usually go with width, height, and resolution, and we'll just say we want to make this a 5 by 7 So this is, I'm going to fill the screen, um, get escape here to get away from that for a second. This is a a vertical image because it's in the portrait mode uh, you could call it a portrait type image because it's tall a uh, horizontal image is obviously uh, wider than it is tall and a vertical is taller than it is wide so <clears throat> when we do the crop we need to think of width is going to be uh, this way obviously and here's the height so First number is the width. We're gonna we're gonna make this a uh, five by seven. So obviously, the seven is going to be the the height of it. So let's go five here and five here. And oops, I meant to put in a seven. No, I need to make this the five, and this one the seven. Hello. And we'll make this 300. For a print, it needs to have the resolution high. So we can grab these handlebars and move them wherever we want. And change that from that super grid to rule the thirds. That's a photographic thing. And we can bring that up. And then we can... Either hit enter or double click on that to actually crop and you see the results. One of the things I'd have to do uh, in Photoshop is uh, get rid of this extra hand that's up here. But that's not hard in Photoshop. Okay, let's step back in our history uh, so we have our full image back. And uh, you see we also have the perspective uh, crop tool. So that works like this and can be kind of unique. As you can see there, uh, I haven't found anything that's uh, practical for yet, but I'm sure there are many things. All right, now on to the eyedropper. This is a fantastic tool. Whatever we sample inside the image, you'll see our foreground color will change to that. So I will sample Pat's uh, skin tone right there on her cheek. And you can see the color right here. Here's my shirt, her sweater, white, a little off-white. There's the gray. Now you say, why would you need to know that? Well... If you're going to paint in a color, you want to have a similar color uh, to paint with. So let's just go up here in the image. 
I'm going to go to my layers. I'm going to create a blank layer. So this is sitting on top of the overall image. And let's just sample this part of the sweater. And now it's the same color as, as her sweater is. Turn on the paintbrush and I'm going to change the opacity. And I just start painting and see I'm painting away the finger. Now this isn't the ideal way because uh, yes it's painting and it's covering and all that but there is no texture there. So what we uh, need to really do is clone and we, we can actually erase what whatever's on that layer. Just hit delete there. <clears throat> We can use the clone stamp, which we'll get to in a second, but we can make it fairly the same size as that area. And we hold down the Alt key, provides this target, and we go right up there where that matches up, and we just paint. And you see we've got the, the uh, same texture. And we can paint with this up there until we actually fill that in. So we're getting rid of the hand and we're still getting a uh, sweater in. If I zoom back out, you'll see that if we turn this off, we've gotten rid of quite a bit of that finger. So lots and lots we can do. In good old Photoshop, again, we use the Alt key or Option key on a Mac. And we can begin to get rid of this part also. So the magic of Photoshop is coming to life right there. Sometimes we actually have to take, when, when we have no shoulder information like here, what we could do is take this shoulder and copy it and turn it around the opposite way over here and fill in the shoulder. So that's just a little trick for now. You'll see it later. Um, under this tool, we also have the color sampler tool and it gives you the information and actual information of the color. So if I click uh, on her cheek again, the RGB information is one of the things that we're very interested in. And so if I click here, 204, 174, 145 is right here. Uh, I can go into my RGB or my color picker and RGB and change it right here to correspond and get an exact color. Uh, just now you see everywhere I clicked. I got a target that's represented right here. Here's target one over here by my eye. Target two is on her cheek. Target three is right here on her sweater. So let me get rid of those. I can just, uh, well, we'll get to that. Uh, so let's go to the this tool and you'll see lots of really cool stuff here. Lots of power in the uh, healing brushes. So if I click on the very top one, that's the spot healing tool. Uh, I got to get rid of these uh, little targets or they're, they are really going to bug me. So I'm going to bring up, uh, let me get rid of that. I'm going to bring up levels. And what levels will allow me to do, I think, is go in here and move that or not. Okay, I'm going to go back into my color sampler and I'm going to go right to it. You see the little tag target come up and we just drag it off the screen and it's gone. Okay, that one's gone and that one's gone. Okay, now on to the spot healing tool. Now remember I mentioned this over here and what we do is make uh, the brush size the same size as any blemish that we see in the image. So that's about the right size and we just paint 
a little bit and you got to be on the right layer the blemish isn't on layer one and there it goes these tools uh, when they came along uh, made so many people so very happy uh, because they eliminated hours of tedious work inside of Photoshop and I do mean tedious so you know if you had red spots and, and freckles that you don't want to show or a mole that you think is disturbing you can just make that thing go right away and you can do it over and over until you're happy uh, if you go to the next tool this one is a little more specific um, let's see if we can find something now this is a I don't know button or something I don't know what it is actually but if we want to use this tool we need to go to a clean area and hold down the alt key or option key on a Mac and go up here and paint over the offending article and we can do it again there and clean whatever we want up so whenever this the regular spot healing tool I uh, won't do it for you try the healing brush tool the patch tool is a bigger corrective type tool and what it does is allow you to make a selection around something and then uh, fix it by moving the offending thing to another place so I made this selection with the tool I'm going to move it and it shows you in the preview right here what's going to happen when you let go so just like that the bad place is gone it's a great tool really great tool and it works wonderful for big objects as well as small objects so I'm not gonna make my wife's eye disappear but let's try my eye how about them apples we can kinda kill that a little bit there so obviously we can do the alien thing too all right, let's uh, step back a few. Control Alt Z, Command Option Z on a Macintosh, and just keep going backwards till I appear somewhat normal. I'm going to turn off those what we call uh, when we have a selection, and you see that movement in it. That's an animation. We call those marching ants. And um, to get rid of those marching ants, remember we can go to Select and down to deselect or we can use control D will make that go away alright then uh, the content aware move tool uh, kind of the same thing only different that's right it takes one thing and moves it <laughs> to another place and heals the place that it came from so we can uh, hit enter and move it again wherever we want control alt z command option z on a mac and then control d to get rid of the marching ants uh, the red eye you saw a little bit of we will work on another image later on that has some really strong red eyes so you can see the change all right, down to the paintbrush. Now, the paintbrush uh, obviously just does uh, like any other. I'm going to get rid of the stuff that's on this layer. <clears throat> it uh, will paint with whatever we have down here in the color picker. So whatever color we choose, that's what color it paints with. Now, notice I can see through, or you can see through, the paint. Now that's because the opacity is only 63 percent. So if I make that a hundred, drag that slider up, then we can't see through. Right? Control Alt Z a few times. 
Now, the flow is kind of the same way. You don't really see much there in the way, way of change. Now, let's try it with 100%. Just a little lighter uh, before that with the flow way down. Uh, let's see, here we got... Uh, if we use a, a pen tool, uh, we can click this and the pressure uh, will apply. If we click this, it's kind of like using a strong uh, spray paint. And if we click that back off, eh, there's not a whole lot of difference really. And then we have the uh, pressure size went off. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of all the stuff that's there. Go back to the brush and click and hold. Here is uh, a magical little item, in, in my humble opinion. Uh, this is the paintbrush. If you want to turn an image into a painting, for example, or even create original art, this is the tool. You've got lots of brushes inside of Photoshop. But you've got uh, several right in here and here that are dedicated to uh, painting. The fan brush is probably uh, one of the, the more well-used ones inside of Photoshop. <clears throat> and you notice, I have a lot of brushes. Yours won't default with that many brushes. But if you click the little gear right here, you have access to all of these free brushes inside of Photoshop. Some of them are very, very nice. You just have to load them up. Uh, here's the trick when you do it. Let's say I want to load uh, natural brushes. It's going to ask me if I want to just add them, which will throw those brushes in and throw everything else away. If you just want to add them to what already exists, you click Append. I'm going to cancel because I don't want to change anything. All right, so if I paint now, uh, notice uh, I've got a little animation thing going here. Right next to my paintbrush that is selected, which is right here, uh, is a folder-looking thing which is this. This is the control over that brush completely. As it stands right now, here is the brush tip shape. We can change uh, all of these things about this brush. We can also change how many bristles. You can see in the animation down here what that does. Uh, the length of the bristles, the thickness of the bristles, the stiffness, and the angle, and the spacing. So lots of control, plus you have shape dynamics. Now these really come into play uh, if you've got a uh, graphics tablet. You can really get in there and change things. Scattering is also a biggie. Uh, if you want to paint leaves or something like that, we'll get into that later in the semester. All right, let's just turn those things off and so you can see what's going on in the image. Now, we're going to paint. Uh, let's just sample the eye right I'm just going to sample the eyebrow. Uh, I'm not getting... Here we go. I created a bunch of targets. Yay. Uh, go and get rid of these. I just moved that. Didn't get rid of it. Okay. And gone with that one. So we have the color sampled. I'll turn that brush back on. And just so you can see, there's what it looks like. We're painting uh, with the brown. Now it's on its own layer. 
so it's not hurting the the actual image uh, so I just wanted you to see the strokes how they look now that's this rib looking thing or spiny looking thing is because of the spacing so let's go back in here and change the spacing on this <clears throat> and get rid of that so that's the way the brush looks when it's huge but you can see the uh, actual texture of the brush now I'm gonna get rid of all that again and this time I'm gonna tell it I want to sample all these layers so it's gonna paint with the color that's down here in the actual image right here so I'm gonna change this uh, to where it's not painting with that color it's painting with Steve basically see wherever I paint it's painting with that color R rather harshly but that's what's going on okay so let's get rid of that again hit that and now we can start playing with the flow make that lower um, and we just kind of paint and drag a little bit. Now this is a huge brush, so it makes huge changes very quickly. Normally I would paint with a much smaller brush, but I just wanted you to see what it was going to do. Let's make it smaller so it's a little more practical here. And when I get started doing this, I kind of get, like, make that a little, see I'm bringing the lighter areas in and mixing with the darker areas so you can, rounding those cheeks, making it, making me a little larger than, and more like I am now. So hopefully you can see what's what's taking place as a result of this tool uh, anyway that's a that's a real quick deal as I continue to change this down here lighten this up a little bit by dragging some lighter area into the darker area and then you can uh, you obviously if you're painting something you're not going to have tons of detail. It's time to simplify when it comes to things with dent detail in them. So uh, it's not real practical to have uh, all these particular lines going through. Now some of that's light and dark. going very very quickly obviously and I can push whoops push the whole image away bring the darker areas up if I want to all right I don't want to spend forever on this we got more tools to go but I think you've got the idea of what's going on with this fantastic brush tool I painted portraits uh, with this, I've actually painted a portrait for John A. Logan College. It's hanging down the conference center. Uh, make this a little bigger and get rid of some of that stuff that's in there. Anywho, there, there you go. That gives you an example of what that tool can do. Now. I've got hair brushes that I can use as well, uh, but for this, oops, smeared my ear. It just turns, uh, 
the colors in your image into paint. That's why it's called wet. As you see right here, uh, it's how wet the image is with, with paint. We can say dry, and then it's painting with color only, like this color. Okay, if it's dry, it's painting with that. Okay, but if that's off, we want to paint uh, very wet, makes it uh, a lot stronger. If it's uh, just moist, it's a little thinner and so forth. So hopefully that gives you an idea. But look at the difference uh, that we made in, in that image. Just a little goofing around. Okay, now under that is also the mixer, uh, I'm sorry, the pencil tool, uh, which allows you to basically draw with uh, any particular color you want to. Normally you use, you use black for a pencil, uh, but it's not a real sophisticated tool. It's not used a lot by anybody, but it is there. Okay. So let's do control zero and I'm going to do get rid of the stuff that's on there. Oh, I didn't get rid of those pins after all. Okay. Uh, rubber stamp tool is uh, used to be referred to as the clone tool. And we can sample with the Alt key again or Option key on a Mac. And we can uh, put whatever we want wherever we want. We'll put my nose over here. So the clone stamp is really uh, very powerful. So my nose is definitely between my eyes there. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, it's good for healing uh, problems. So if we had a big mark uh, somewhere, it's uh, really nice to remove those things. So let's just look down here and say we want to get rid of... Uh, see, I'm still carrying that piece of eyeball around in the sampler. Uh, if I want to get rid of this right here, I can sample this good information up here with the Alt key down and then come in here and and paint. Now the key also to this is uh, that whatever you're cloning with sh probably needs to be soft. So let me um, undo that and try it again. Make it a little softer. See if, if you clone it in when the brush is hard it has one type of effect and hard means uh, this is all the way hard. The edge is very uh, stiff like that and if we go the opposite way this is uh, the opposite of hardness is soft so now if I clone see how feathery the edges of that are compared to that so the clone stamp is nice pattern stamp is uh, basically cloning with a pattern uh, we want to get down here to the history uh, brush tool which is used uh, I very rarely too. Uh, not too many people that I even know use these two tools. Okay, let's say I want to paint uh, some history back into this. That's what this history brush actually does. I remember I went in there and painted on my face. So if I go into history, uh, let's go back where I actually did quite a bit of painting. Let's go to the end of the painting material. Go back here to layers and if I paint with this tool see how I, I painted back in uh, where I painted earlier. I'm just selectively painting what I did a while ago right let me let me do that again all right turn this back on and I'm gonna get rid of the stuff that's on there now and now I'm going back 
to this particular history state by clicking right here that's going to allow me to paint from where I did the painting with the paintbrush I know it sounds confusing let's just do let's just bring the painting back from what I did in the face so see it come back in even the hair that I painted at the end so if I don't want that hair there let me just control alt Z and I'm gonna paint just the places where I smooth things out and we'll say I like that part I don't want the hair part in there so that's the the advantage of doing the art history tool we can go anywhere back in history and paint from that particular thing so let me show you now what the art history brush does if I click this one that's under the history brush the art history brush is what I would call rather bizarre. Uh, if I just paint right here, for example, now you see what happens. So you can go all over the place, and there you go. So let's take this down and do it again. Uh, that's why it's called the art history brush it's very different okay uh, to me it's not real practical but it, it's there now the eraser brush I'm going to get rid of that layer and I'm going to create the thing we did earlier just a selection around my head let me do a control D here there we go control J to make that copy and what I'm going to do is erase that's the eraser tool right here <clears throat> and I can go in here and turn the brush up to 100% and I can erase anything I don't want now, on the right-hand side of my keyboard are bracket keys. They're right by the letter P, a left and right bracket. The right bracket key uh, is an enlargement of the brush, and the left is to make the brush smaller. Now, notice it has soft, and if we go up here, it has hard. So it erases without the softness involved. If we turn the hardness all the way off, then we get nice soft edges. Just change it back so you can see that. See how much softer that is. So it, it for hair and stuff like that, it makes it a little bit nicer. Now that the the problem with the eraser tool is once you're done using it, and obviously we cut some of my head off when we made the selection, that's no biggie. Um, we can't do anything with it now. It's That stuff is gone. Anything that we erase is gone. Now, the only thing we can do is go back in the history state and look at all the states I used. Get back here to undo everything but uh, once you've exhausted your history states uh, whatever you erased is just gone you can't bring it back so it's never good uh, I don't think to use your eraser it's one of those things if you have to you have to but it's not a preferred and you'll see as we get into other tools uh, during the semester and I'm referring to using masks which uh, look like this let me uh, get this back in the history that it was and then right here is a mask it looks like a square donut if we click that we can paint now again 
don't worry about remembering all this stuff. We're just going to scratch this right now, and we'll talk more about it later. Uh, I'm painting with black, which makes this kind of hide. Um, so you can see, I'm, it looks like I'm erasing this, right? But if you look over here, you see uh, an X in there. And uh, I can just keep going. And you see lots of little scribbles in that. Uh, but if I paint with white, switch this color, uh, look at it. It's all coming back. Nothing is really erased. It's hiding things and showing things is what a mask is all about. This is uh, one of the huge powers of Photoshop is learning to use a mask and using it well, so to speak. Uh, if I paint with black again, bam. If I paint with white, blam. Bam and blam. So I can do the same thing with it that I did while ago with the eraser, but I'm never throwing stuff away. Now this is soft brush. Well, this is medium. And here's a hard brush. You see the difference in those edges? Let's go back. Soft. Look at the difference between those edges. Okay, now I could make the brush smaller and, and really do a nice job around the sides and so forth and make it look right. And if I go too far and cut the ear off, I just switch to white and bring it back. That's the beauty of this and as opposed to using the uh, eraser, I can bring back anything I want all the data is held right there in that mask that allows things to be hidden or to show. Okay, just for your information. That's all that's for. Alright, we got rid of that. And let's go on down. Uh, the background eraser is just what it says. It's made to use to click on the background and, and get rid of it. You can make a bigger brush using the bracket keys and it's sampling as we go see it didn't really do a very good job because this image is so doggone dark okay but it's supposed to help you get rid of the background without getting rid of see it didn't get rid of the hand and stuff that was more uh, contrasty in the image so it did an okay job it's not a great tool it just frankly is not a great tool so let's Let's go back up here before they use that thing. The magic eraser tool, that's what it does. It samples, and you can see up here uh, the settings that you can use. Usually contiguous is helpful. Uh, you might want to drop the, pre the uh, tolerances, let's say 16. Let's undo that. Try it again. So you can play with those and try to get a better selection. Usually these aren't the best ways to get rid of a background. And we'll address all those things in the course as we go as well. On down, this is the gradient. And here is the gradient editor up here. So let's create a new blank layer. You see how important the layers palette is by now. Uh, Right now, if we click on that, these are the gradient presets that we have. But again, there's that little gear, and if we click on that, we have all of these uh, different kinds of uh, gradients that we can load up. So, uh, let's say we want um, photographic toning. Uh, again, append it. Don't click OK or it overwrites. So now we have uh, different gradients. This is uh, cyan sepia. And basically you can click and drag, hold down your shift key and it'll be even. And then you can see the gradient itself. And then you can change the opacity of that. See how it affects it. Now, 
something like a gradient is used in so many different ways, and we'll get to that later on as well. I wanted you to see uh, what a gradient did. Uh, one of the most commonly used is the black to invisible or black to uh, uh, see-through. So let me get rid of what's on that layer right now. And so that's what a black to invisible looks like. It's just creating uh, black and then there's nothing else. And you can see that right here in this layer. Let's put it from the bottom going up. And so it made the, the bottom darker and the top is fine. So this is used uh, quite a bit for, for different things. Uh, control Alt Z that. There are lots of uh, presets in here. This one may not seem real practical, uh, but it does have its uses, and we'll get into that, like I said. This is the uh, finger smudge. Now let's go with the blur here first. <clears throat> let's go into the eyes. Now this is not a sharp image to begin with. Let's go to the original information right here. And if we click and drag that, you see my eye is becoming very, very soft compared to this eye. Then I can make that one go soft also. Well, let's go back. Now underneath there is also the smudge tool and let's go back to the right layer again and it's just that it smudges and you can control this a great deal uh, here's how strong it is right now and you can use multiple layers if you want to and you can turn it into finger painting uh, using the left bracket key to let's see I'm having to stroke multiple times now to get it to smear Not very flattering right there at all, but it does have its place, like I said. Uh, let's go down to the sharpen. <clears throat> now I can make my eyes sharper looking. And you see this definitely has some advantages. If we go back, here's the before and after. So it can make a significant difference. Uh, I don't use any of those tools a lot, but I do use them. The dodge tool withholds light. So it, what I'm saying is in the dark room, if uh, you were in a dark room and you dodge something, you're holding light back so it doesn't get as dark. <clears throat> so when we dodge something, it makes it lighter. When we burn something, let's go back. Let's go back up here. When we burn something, it does just the opposite. It's going to make it darker. And it used this used to be such a tragic looking tool to use. It would do serious da damage almost instantaneously. Now it's a much refined uh, tool. But again, you might want to click and drag and make that uh, a little less so you don't come in quite so strong with with this exposure. Now you notice that I didn't click inside this box or hit this drop down to change the exposure. Instead I clicked on where it says exposure and I can do what they call a fuzzy drag and change that exposure. That works on lots and lots of tools. Okay. <clears throat> and then the sponge tool which saturates and desaturates. In this case it's desaturating and in this case it's saturating. So it has very limited uses but there are some uses. Control Z a couple of times. Then to text. This is a very powerful part of Photoshop as well. There's two ways to make text on an image. When you click this tool it's going to create its own layer. So if I click right now and put in Photoshop, uh, the word is humongous because it's 50 point. But I'm going to go up to where you see the 
the two little T's, click and left click and drag, I mean, if it'll let me. And for some reason it's not wanting to work just right. It's got to be selected. There we go. So now I can move that over with the move tool. <clears throat> now, if I wanted to keep typing, I can't right now. I can double click here and I can add is the greatest. Well, it just keeps running off the page, right? So let me copy that and do this instead. I'm going to create a new layer, click on text again. This time I'm going to click and drag a box. This is a text box. And now I can type right inside that and it wraps around real nicely. If I want to change the color of that, I can go up here and click on this uh, color picker and change it to black and click the move tool. And now you see it's in black or it can be any other color. I double click it and click here and make it red. Click. You can either click the check box up here or the move tool or just hit enter. Whoops. Let me undo that. Uh, click outside the text box with your mouse and it will complete the text for you. So there you go on the text. Moving on down to the pen tool. Let's just get rid of uh, the, these text boxes. The pen tool is uh, a more precise way to make a selection. So if I click it, now it takes a little getting used to, but we'll do some exercises uh, with the pen tool. But let's say I want to select the eyebrow. So I can click and make straight selections or straight lines and reconnect like that. I'm going to hit escape and let's do a control Z here and go all the way back. I can select this eyebrow, but I can't do it in straight lines. So what I have to do is click, click and drag to create a little arch. Click and drag. Click and drag. Click and drag. Click and drag. So it can get a little hairy doing those selections like that, but they are extremely um, perfected edges. So if I go to window right now and go down to paths, and here's the, the, the path panel, and I want to change that into a selection, I can. And it's a very precise selection. All right. Let's get rid of that. So the path is gone. The selection is still there. I'm going to get rid of that. All of these other tools under the pen tool, refine that pen and change it a little bit. This also works with the pen tool uh, to select the path. And then we're down to the special character. Now, the thing about these special characters uh, that are in this particular tool is that they are all uh, a special type of graphic. They are called a vector graphic. A photograph, like you see here of my wife and I, this is a, called a raster graphic. It's made up of a fixed number of pixels, uh, of data with color and all that good stuff. But these particular things are made up of numerical data. They're a formula and they never lose quality. So if I click on the custom, for example, and I come up here and click, I've got tons of special characters and they're all perfect. So if I click on this rabbit, for example, and I drag it, it fills it in based on uh, color and the color pickers, that rabbit is a perfect uh, shape and no matter how big I make it or how small I make it that rabbit will stay perfect well that's not true 
of this raster image. If I make it huge, it gets softer and softer. If I make it small, it does the same thing. And if I make it large again after I've made it small, it gets terrible. The rabbit, no matter what you do to that rabbit, you see the fine edges of it, it's still going to be perfect. So let's just uh, click on the rabbit and we'll just make him bigger. So you can see he doesn't change. He just looks great no matter what we do to it. Okay? So you've got uh, very specific things here. The octagonal can be rotated and resized and so forth. Um, there are several tools that are right there handy. But the one I use the most is the custom tool. And again, it's got a gear right over here that lets you add uh, lots of different vector graphics to your images or your project, whatever your project might be. Get rid of that. All right, this is a really cool uh, tool. Uh, <clears throat> you can use the hand at any time you want to in an image. You can press the letter H. And let's just make this image really, really big. And I can move around with the hand. If I press the letter H, I get the hand. If I press the letter R, I can rotate the image. Look at that. Well, you say, what's, what's the good of rotating the image? Well, what if I want to paint uh, on my eyebrows again? It's easier to paint like this than it is to paint sideways. Okay, so it's like having a painter's canvas. You can move it on the easel to its side if you want to. You can flip it upside down if you want to. Uh, if you don't have a graphics accelerator and can't use OpenGL on your computer, this feature will not work. All right, that's the two uh, tools under that. Then you got the magnifying glass, which pretty much speaks for itself. You click, 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 and wherever you're clicking, it'll zoom in there. Uh, I also like to click and drag, and it will zoom in and out. Now, if I turn this off, the scrubby zoom, when I have the magnifying glass on, I can draw a selection, and it will pop to that selected area. Very cool. If I want to get back out to normal size, like I zoom in on my eyes, I can do a control zero, the number zero on your keyboard, and it will pull back to full size regular image. All right, moving on down. Again, this is the color picker. We can switch back and forth with this little arrow, or we can press the letter X on the keyboard We'll toggle that back and forth. All right, down below is what's called the quick mask. You can also press the letter Q on the keyboard. Notice that just changed to quick mask. So what it's going to allow me to do is uh, paint with what's called ruby lith, or used to be called ruby lith. And what that will do when I press Q again is turn into a mask. Now notice the outside and the inside both have marching ants. And the reason for that is if you double click on this little uh, mask dealie down there, double click it, and it shows you masked areas. What you want is selected areas. Change that and it should stay that way from now on. So watch what happens when I paint now. Whoops. Got to press the Q or that mask thingy. And that's red now. So this should make a selection that's not bad. Press Q again. And that area is selected. Now let me show you something real quick. If I use the paintbrush... I'm going to put up a new layer here, and I'm going to paint with red again. 
I'm painting, 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 and nothing happens. That's because there's a selection here. If I paint inside that selection, the marching ants, it works. But it won't paint anywhere else. But it'll paint there. Okay. Let me undo that. Control Z a few times. And now I'm going to inverse that. So I go to select and inverse. That means everything here is selected but my face. So all of this and my face is not selected. So I paint and paint and paint and paint and I can't paint my face. Get it? So everything but my face in this image is selected. All right. Let's let's undo and select inverse. Now it's just my face that's selected. I can't paint anywhere else but inside the selected area. If I turn around and select Pat's face too, oops, I'm on the uh, magnetic uh, lasso there. Let's just click on the regular lasso. And now the paintbrush. And now I can't paint anywhere else, including my face, but I can here. So whatever selected is only the, the only place you can do anything. And the reason I want to make such a federal case out of this is sometimes in an image you inadvertently, eventually you will do it, where there's the tiniest little selection made. You can't even see the thing. This, this isn't particularly tiny compared to some of the things I've done, but you can't do anything anywhere else in your image because there's a selection made. You, you just can't work. But inside that little area that just turned red, I can work. So sometimes inadvertently we uh, create little tiny selections that we can't see with the naked eye. So if, if something starts happening where you can't work on your image, it could be that somewhere lurking in the background is a little tiny selected area. And so it's always good to either go to select and deselect or do a control D to get out of that problem. So you now you've had a look at all of the tools. They're not as horrible as some folks might think they are. And over here we have a lot of adjustment things that we can do in the image and we're going to cover those uh, down the road. They're not necessary to get started in Photoshop by any stretch. But some of them are pretty obvious if you want to play around with them. Like this one that has the little sunlight on it. That's brightness and contrast. So if you click that, you run the brightness up, down, contrast up, down. It's no more than that. But look what happens. When it did that, it created its own mask. The thing down here. So we can control where that light stays and, and where it doesn't. Uh, and the other nice thing about it is when you use one of these, you can double click on it again and change it if you want to. Maybe you really meant to do this to the image instead. And if you save it now, like you know we saved it earlier, as Pat and Steve working, well, if we save it, this will always be there. We come back and we can readjust it and make it a little lighter again make ourselves happy on command so to speak uh, you've got ways of adjusting the color saturation of the colors and again lightness and darkness but this is a little flatter light than the other way uh, again this is levels uh, that we started out showing you but it was the big levels panel this is all the light dark information, and this in the middle is the midtones. So we will get to all that. Those are photographic things that you're going to enjoy playing around with. I hope you're excited about all the stuff that you can do. Now you see the tools. Uh, anything that's in here that you want to go back and revisit, it's right there in the video. Anytime you want to come back and see it, you can do it. Okay? 
as your instructor, I'm always open for any questions that you might have on the subjects and I'll do my level best to answer each and every one of them to your satisfaction. Just let me know that something's bugging you and we'll work it out. All right, that's it for this lesson one. I promise you the future lessons won't be near this long, but there's a lot to get going with, a lot to see, and uh, if you watch this, hopefully you can come back the next lesson and ask those questions about whatever you have. Talk to you all later. Have a great day. Bye-bye.